What's going on guys? My name is Matt and today I have another PC build for you. Just like the last few, this one is going to be a full build guide. I'm not only going to tell you about each of the parts and why I picked them, but I'm also going to show you how to put everything together step by step and show you how the system performs in a bunch of games. The price point for this build is $750 and this is a really good sweet spot for price to performance PC gaming. For this price, you're getting a no compromise machine with great looks and the ability to play anything you throw at it. Not only this, but it can also be used for streaming and some light video editing. Just like the other PC build guides, this video is in partnership with Micro Center. They're not paying me for this video, but they did provide some of the parts for this build, and they're one of the main reasons I've been able to bring you these PC build guides. I went off of pricing on Amazon and Newegg, but if you were to build this PC buying parts from Micro Center, you could save a fair amount of money through combo deals and other discounts. If you have a Micro Center near you, I would highly recommend you check it out. Out. It's by far the best place to buy PC parts in store and they have a much larger selection than any other store I've seen. So thanks again to Micro Center for partnering with me for this build. So let's go ahead and talk about the parts that make up this $750 gaming beast starting with the CPU. The CPU market right now is amazing. You can get so much value for your dollar and powerful gaming CPUs are surprisingly affordable. What I went with is the Ryzen 5 3600. This can be usually found for a little under $190 and for that price you're getting amazing performance. This is a 6 core 12 thread CPU running on the Zen 2 architecture. IPC on this guy is really great and it can be overclocked a good bit which I'll get into later in the video. Performance wise this guy comes very close to many of the Intel CPUs that cost nearly twice as much. With all this being said even though the system is meant for gaming having a 12 thread CPU means you can do stuff like streaming and 1080p video editing with ease. This CPU is truly a jack of all trades and is a a perfect fit for this build. Another big plus of the CPU is it actually comes with a relatively capable stock cooler included in the box. This looks pretty good in my opinion and not only is it good for cooling the CPU at stock settings, but it can actually handle a mild overclock. It has pre-applied thermal paste and using the stock cooler instead of opting for an aftermarket one saves a good amount of cash that can be used in other areas to improve performance. For the motherboard, I wanted to go B450 as this provides a good value for the money and allows for overclocking. I've been doing a lot of micro ATX builds so I decided to go full ATX on this build and I got the big brother of my favorite B450 board. This is the ASRock B450 Pro 4. This board offers a ton of features for the $85 that it's currently going for. You're getting a ton of PCIe slots, dual M.2 slots which isn't something you normally see on a board of this price, and the VRM setup is not half bad. The VRMs are actively cooled and while they're pretty basic, the Pro 4 line of boards offer the best overclocking capabilities in their price range from my experience. Overall, you can't go wrong with this board and it's a great fit for this build. Next up is RAM. I knew I wanted to get a 16GB kit of DDR4 that needed to be clocked relatively high. What I went with is the 16GB kit of Corsair Vengeance LPX clocked at 3200MHz CL16. 3200MHz is a great sweet spot for price to performance DDR4 meant to be used with a Ryzen system. And the cool thing is Zen 2 is rated to work with 32 200 megahertz RAM out of the box. 16 gigabytes is plenty for gaming, streaming, and even 1080p video editing. I did recently upgrade to 32 gigabytes myself, but I edited on 16 gigabytes of RAM for many years and it worked great. For storage, I went with a 512 gigabyte Inland Premium NVMe M.2 SSD. This is a blazing fast PCIe based SSD, which is perfect for a boot drive. 512 gigabytes is plenty for your OS, applications, and a good number of games. I think starting with just this SSD is fine because it'll give you enough space for a good while, and you can always upgrade to a second SSD or large hard drive for mass storage in the future. Also, one of my favorite things about this drive is the fact it's in the M.2 form factor. It takes seconds to install, and you don't have to route a data or power cable the same way you would have to for a normal 2.5 or 3.5 inch SATA drive. Moving on to the graphics card, I went with something that will provide great performance in any game you throw at it. There are a ton of graphics card models on the market right now. But what I went with is an NVIDIA GTX 1660 Super. The new 1660 Super and 1650 Super offer some
some really good value for the money. The 1660 Super I went with is this EVGA SC Ultra model. This was one of the cheaper 1660 Supers on the market when I purchased it at around $230, but prices have changed a fair bit, so I'll leave a few options for 1660 Supers around the $230 price point in the description below. This is a relatively short card, but subjectively, I think it looks pretty awesome. The cooler design is cool, and it has a backplate, which is nice to see. It's a dual fan design with a decent sized aluminum fin array. The cooler keeps the card relatively cool and quiet, and this card has been a dream to use. The 1660 Super offers great performance at 1080p and even 1440p in a lot of titles. The combo of this and the R5 3600 is a great match and should serve you well for years to come. Powering the system is the Corsair CX550. This is a 550 watt, 80 plus bronze rated unit that provides plenty of clean power to the entire system. For around $60, this is a pretty good value for the money. It is non-modular, but it has fully black cables, which keeps things looking nice and clean. And the non-modular part isn't a big deal because of our case, which is the Deep Cool Matrix 55 Add RGB. This is a $70 case that offers a lot of value for its price. It has a side and front panel made out of tempered glass, and it has three included RGB fans which look absolutely amazing. This is an ATX mid-tower case which is plenty big for our system and allows for many upgrades in the future. Also it has a built-in RGB controller, so if your motherboard doesn't have an RGB header or you don't want to control the lights with software, then you can just cycle through the dozens of lighting effects. I personally like the classic rainbow effect, but there are options for pretty much everyone. Overall, this is a great case and I can highly recommend it to anyone looking for a case in the $70 price range. Altogether, for $750, you're getting a group of parts that are all high quality and will work well for gaming for years to come. This guy performs great, which I'll show in the benchmarks towards the end of the video, but now it's time to show you how to put this guy together. There are a ton of different ways to assemble this PC, but I'm going to show you my preferred method. Before you get building, it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you'll really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a smaller Phillips head screwdriver for the M.2 screw. I would highly recommend using a magnetic screwdriver. This will make building a PC a little bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. Next, let's talk about static. I personally don't worry about it and have never had had any issues or problems with it. If you live in a very dry place or are worried about it, you can use an anti-static ground strap like this one or periodically ground yourself on something like a light switch screw. With your workspace ready to go, your schedule clear, and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. There are a number of different orders and ways to assemble this PC, but I'll show you the steps I went through to assemble mine. Go ahead and start by getting out your motherboard box. Take out the IO shield, the manual, the board itself, and the M.2 screw. Take the motherboard out and set it on the motherboard box. The first thing to install is our CPU. Get your CPU box out and open. Grab out the CPU clamshell and the cooler box. Before getting the CPU completely out, push down and out on the AM4 socket arm and lift up so the arm is perpendicular to the board. Next, take out your CPU, handling it only by the edges, and line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard. Set the CPU into place and apply no pressure, it should just drop in by itself. Another way to know the CPU is lined up before dropping it in is by having the Ryzen logo closest to and parallel with the top large edge of the socket. Once in, lower the lever arm back down and make sure it clips into place under the notch. Now it's time to install our cooler. But before this is done, we need to remove the four screws on the standard AM4 mounting brackets. Once these are out, lift these two pieces out but leave the back plate in place. The cooler has pre-applied thermal paste so no need to add any at this step. Line up the screws in the cooler with the standoffs in the back plate. Lower this into place with the Ryzen logo either facing to the right or left. Once lowered in and lined up, tighten down the four screws going in a cross pattern until completely tightened down. Next, locate the CPU fan header at the top of the motherboard and grab the CPU fan cable. Line the notch in the header with the notch on the fan connector and push it into place. This shouldn't require a lot of force, so make sure you don't force it in in a weird way as you could bend pins. Next up is to install our RAM. We have two sticks and I'll be using the second and fourth slots from the left. Open up the clips on both slots and grab one of your RAM sticks. Align the notch in the slot with the notch in the RAM stick and lower it into place. Once you're sure it's in the slot, press down on both sides until you hear a click and see the clip close up. Repeat this with your other stick of RAM. 
This leaves you with two open slots to easily upgrade in the future. Next up, it's time to install our SSD. Get out your SSD, the M.2 screw, and your smaller screwdriver for this step. We're going to be installing our SSD in the slot that says Ultra M.2. This is the only PCIe one as the other slot only supports SATA drives. Line the notches in the M.2 drive with the notches in the slot. At a 45 degree angle, insert the M.2 drive into the slot and lower it down to the standoff. Install the screw into place and boom, your SSD is installed. You can go ahead and set your motherboard to the side because it's time to open up our case. Open up the box, flip it upside down, and lift the cardboard box away. Flip it so the feet are facing up and remove that piece of foam. Expose the feet from the bag, flip it back up, and lift the foam and bag away. Start by removing the back panel by unscrewing each thumb screw, one on the top and one on the bottom. Pull the panel back and lift it away. Now set the case on its side and unscrew the four thumb screws holding the glass panel into place. Make sure to put these in a safe place. Now lift the glass up and away from the case. It's a good idea to put the foam, the bag, and both of the side panels back into the case box to make sure they don't get knocked over or damaged. Now take the IO shield we took out of the motherboard box before and line it up like this and press all four corners into place. This is kind of annoying to do but just make sure it's secure and in place. Before we install the motherboard we need to install an extra standoff. Grab the tied up bag that's in the main compartment of the case and pull out one of the standoffs that looks like this. Go ahead and install it in this hole by the PCIe covers. I used a nut driver to install it but you can use a pair of pliers or even just finger tighten it down. Once this is done you can go ahead and grab your motherboard by the cooler and lower it into place. Line the IO up with the IO shield and make sure you can see the standoffs through the motherboard holes. Now grab out seven of these motherboard screws. Go ahead and install a screw in each hole that has a standoff beneath it. Once this is done your motherboard is installed and it's now time to turn your attention to the power supply. Take the power supply out of the box and get the cables loose. Pull aside the 24 pin cable that looks like this, the 8 pin CPU cable that looks like this, one PCIe cable that looks like this, and then go ahead and wrap the rest of the cables back up. This is optional, but I used two of the zip ties that came with the PSU to hold the bundle together, and also make sure there's a Molex connector towards the outside of this bundle. Now we can take the power supply and slide it into the case like this with the fan facing down. Line the holes in the power supply with the holes in the back of the case. Grab the four screws that came with the power supply and install all four in the four corresponding holes to secure the PSU. It's now time for plugging in all of the cables. Start by untying all these cables to get them out of the way. Grab the 24 pin PSU cable and push it through this hole. Now take the 8 pin CPU cable and push it through this hole here. And then take the PCIe cable and push it through this bottom hole here. Take the 24 pin cable and align the notch in the connector with the notch in the header and press it into place. Now take the 8 pin CPU cable and align the two notches then press it into place. The PCIe cable we just leave to the side for now. We're now ready to start installing the front panel cables. Take the USB 2 and HD audio cables that look like this and route them through the hole here. Next, take all of these small front panel cables and route them through the same hole that the PCIe power cable went through. Finally, route the USB 3 cable through this hole here. Take the USB 3 cable and align the notch in the connector with the notch in the header and press it into place. For HD audio and USB 2, match the pattern on the pins with the pattern in the connector and press each one into place. The HD audio goes in the bottom left of the motherboard and the USB in one of the two headers towards the middle. Now following the diagram in the motherboard manual, install the front panel connectors including the power button and LED, reset switch, and the hard drive activity light. We can now plug in our fans to the motherboard and power. Take the three-way fan splitter that looks like this and plug all three of the fan cables into it. You can now route this through the same hole as the PCIe power and the front panel connectors. Now plug the Molex cable from the fans into the Molex I told you to keep handy earlier. You can now plug the fan splitter into one of the two fan headers at the bottom of the motherboard. Now the final part we need to install is the graphics card. Start by removing these two PCIe covers by bending them back and forth until they snap snap off. Open up the PCIe lock on the slot and grab your card. Align the notch in the PCIe connector with the notch in the slot and lower the card into place. Once in, align the notch in the PCIe power cable with the GPU power header and plug it into place. You can now install a screw to secure the graphics card into place.
With this done, everything is installed and all that's left to do is to put the side panels back on in the reverse way you took them off. It's now time to install Windows. I'm not going to get into how to do this in this video, but I'll leave a link to a guide on how to do this in the description below. You can run it for free, unactivated, indefinitely with the only downside being an activate windows watermark in the bottom right corner, or you can get a cheap key from a site like SED Keys. With windows installed, now we need to make some quick changes in the BIOS. The first one is optional, but the second you need to do. First, boot the PC up and mash the delete key to enter into the BIOS. Click over to the OC tweaker and change the CPU frequency and voltage from auto to manual. I put my CPU to 4100MHz which is 4.1GHz and the voltage to 1.375V. This should work for everyone and 4.2 or 4.3GHz may work for you with some tweaking. The CPU overclock is optional but everyone needs to do this next step. Scroll down to the XMP setting and hit auto next to XMP setting. Select XMP 2.0 profile 1. Now we can go ahead and select exit in the top right then select to save changes and exit. With all this done you now need to load an Windows and install the motherboard and GPU drivers which I'll leave links to in the description. With the drivers installed you're now ready to download and enjoy some games. I didn't have a ton of time to benchmark so I only tested 4 games, but all of these should help you understand the type of performance the system's putting out. Starting with Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings, the system saw an average of 235 FPS with 1% lows of 201. This was a really great experience and you could probably even play at 1440p competitive settings with above a 144 FPS average. Next up is CSGO at 1080p competitive settings. In CSGO, the system averaged 281 FPS with 1% lows of 172. This again was a great experience. Next up is PUBG at 1080p high settings. At these settings, the system received a 118 FPS average with 1% lows of 92. This was a good experience and you could probably get up to 144 FPS by dropping some of the settings. Finally, I tested Far Cry 5 at 1080p very high settings, and at these settings, the system received a 99 FPS average with 1% lows of 84. This was pretty decent for a relatively modern AAA game at very high settings. As you can see, the system performs really well and I may do a follow-up video with extra benchmarks and some streaming and video editing tests. So if you'd like to see a certain game tested or just would like to see that type of video in general, then let me know in the comment section below. Overall, this is a great machine and building it will give you a well-rounded system that should perform well for years to come. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give it a big thumbs up as well as consider subscribing. Thanks again to Micro Center for partnering with me for this video. They're always a big help. If you have a Micro Center near you, I would highly recommend checking it out. And if you don't know if you have, then go ahead and go online and see if you do. Again, if you like this video, make sure you consider subscribing. And this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.